point. I very much hope this quickly becomes a conversation, not a lecture. And to help that process, as I go through, I'll put lots of questions in. And that I'll ask a question and hopefully get some responses back uh, from people. Um, the, uh, Vera obviously uh, uh, talked about my experience and the fact that I'm working in different places in Norway. Um, the, I'd also add Dramen to that because we're doing a very interesting uh, piece of work uh, about the choices that young people take in culture um, with the uh, young people in Dramen there. Um, but part of that also is that we're working with Telemark Forsting, um, who... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, who've uh, done a survey of all year nines in the uh, whole of Dramen, uh, of which they will have about 85% response, um, about exactly what they're doing in cultural terms. Um, it's a really detailed survey, and it's going to be a really interesting snapshot of, of one um, whole year. The, so in, in terms of this then, it's, a, it's an interesting contrast because uh, this was a very small group of uh, young Norwegians that we spoke to. So again, just to uh, reinforce the points that Vera made, what were we trying to do? We wanted to explore with a small number of peop young people their feelings, expectations, and attitudes towards DKS. And then to allow them to experience and reflect on a range of cultural experiences offered by DKS and beyond. And to create a forum in which they could suggest how the DKS could be developed to meet their needs. Um, the, what's important to say about this way of, of working is obviously it's different from statistical surveys. But we feel very strongly that a lot of the time when we talk to young people, we don't spend the time giving them the skills and experiences to be able to answer our questions properly. Um, I remember uh, in England uh, being in a school where I was watching uh, an architectural firm consulting a group of 13-year-olds about what kind of school they wanted. And the, uh, it was very well-intentioned and uh, because the architects were there to build a whole brand new school and here was the opportunity to talk to young people and say, well, what would you like from a school? But over the workshop as I watched it, what the children really came up with was something which was a cross between the football ground and the shopping mall because really that was what their experience was. Whilst in another school um, up in Stoke, uh, where the school wanted to have the same question about what kind of building they'd like, they actually took 100 pupils to London for a week just to visit buildings and see how different buildings made them feel in order to be able to ask them that question then, well, what would you like? And what you got out of that process was so much more so much richer and more interesting. So it was this notion that uh, through this process we could get much deeper. There were three groups uh, in Trondheim, Lillehammer and in Aarhus. 37 young people altogether aged between 10 and 18. Some who participate culturally and some who don't. Um, Culturally diverse backgrounds, I mean, they were by far in the majority white Norwegians, but they weren't all white Norwegians, they, there was mix in there. Um, there were more girls than boys, because it just proved easier to recruit girls to do this than boys. Um, each group was led by a specially trained artists, um, which we already talked about. Five to six workshops for each group, two and a half to three hours uh, for each workshop. So you're talking about young people actually committing 15 to 20 hours to this process, which is quite a major contribution. But you could really see the development um, that they went through in that period. And so it was to allow the group of young people to experience a range of cultural activities so that their views could be informed by understanding, to allow the groups to have time to develop their thinking, to create an environment in which people were prepared to listen and learn from each other, and to create a forum in which we could challenge their thinking. Uh, 
after the artists had or worked, get, come to the end of this process, uh, I met with them or spoke to them on the telephone, um, in the case of Maria, because she just had a baby. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, and we went through in some detail what happened in those um, processes. Um, but I think that this, this thing about challenging their thinking was an important part of this, that I could see all the artists uh, when the children, when the young people would say, uh, you know, make a comment and so forth, were coming back and going, yeah, but why do you think that? And what's the evidence that that's happening? And so forth. So this notion of challenging them, actually young people really uh, rise to, because it makes the quality of their thinking much better, but you need space and time to be able to do that. Um, we've talked about who the three artists were. All of them have considerable experience of working with children and young people, both within the DKS and, and outside. I think almost all of them, yeah, outside. Uh, they also all happened to uh, have had training with us uh, to be creative agents. Um, the, and were working in programs um, which did that. And uh, I think, as Vera said, we did do a special session together to think through how we were going to tackle this particular task. So, what was um, uh, common to, to the structures is that in they, each group had an opening session in which uh, it was just uh, the group leader, the artist leader, um, and talked about their experience of uh, cultural rack sacks so far. Um, and uh, that allowed us to get some benchmarking, if you like, about where they were in their thinking at that stage. Uh, they then went through a series of workshops with um, artists, and then at the end there was final reflections, and we began to pick up where uh, they had moved to. So I'll start with summarising what was the picture that emerged um, at the start. Um, we asked them what makes a good experience. And um, these were some of the comments which came out from that. It fulfilled a dream I had in the sense that this was something I'd always wanted to do, um, and therefore uh, that in itself was exciting. That the, it was exciting constantly, if you see what I mean, that what it was that we were involved in. I got to participate, it was interactive. I received positive feedback and therefore my presence uh, was acknowledged, if you like. I learned something. Um, I got to almost be a scientist to wear a coat and get uh, a realistic exercise to solve. So again, it was about that involving and participation. And I have good memories from it. Um, what did you not enjoy so much? If it was long with a lone speaker, if they talked about things that didn't engage me, if I didn't understand, if they had poor or no contact with the audience, if I was not in the target group, if it was too old-fashioned, watching things with the whole school, writers talking about books that don't interest me, adults trying to be cool to get in with the kids. <laughs> they, they felt very strongly about the last one. <laughs> Um, but it's just an interesting point of, uh, connecting that with the need to, uh, for the artist or whoever it is to engage with the young people. What good experiences did you have? Uh, film, circus, scientists and journalists. Now this was interesting and I think this is where the benefit of doing this in more depth begins to come through. The, we tended... The uh, creative professionals tended to ask people, what, what have you seen at school that you liked? And the, what the young people understood was pr external professionals coming in. So they aren't necessarily very good at knowing what is DKS and what is not DKS, if you see what I mean. And therefore, they wandered on to other things. So um, in... Uh, in Lillehammer, this thing came up with the whole group that they'd recently, their schools, they all came from different schools, their schools had recently visited by scientists, a chemist, 
And they said, he was just brilliant. He was absolutely fantastic. He was mesmerising. Um, and then a, a couple of journalists had also come in. And um, the one, was from, one had worked in Afghanistan and one of whom um, was from Palestine. And when you question them more deeply, it, it turned out that what these people did was just give a lecture. And you then go back to them going, I don't like it if it's long with a lone speaker. But actually, they very quickly tell you really great experiences they had, which was long and, and a lone speaker. Um, and therefore, there, there is that contradiction. Except it's not a contradiction to me about it, because lecturing is a way of communicating information, if you do. But you've got to be good at it. <laughs> and so many of the people who were sent in uh, to do that kind of thing in schools aren't necessarily good at it. So they remember the boring speech, but when you get them to give specific examples, they will give you specific examples which appear to contradict what, what they were saying. Music, if the performers are high quality. I'm going to concentrate today on what the pupils said. That, that, that's partly because the final part of the research with the teachers isn't finished yet. But it did come up from the teachers and the pupils again and again that the same contradiction that the uh, pupils would go, oh, uh, contemporary classical music, I don't like that, if you see what I mean. But then when you ask them to give examples of what they really like, they will give you an example of that. And the teachers have also said they will enjoy anything if they're great performers. That, that's the core there. And the, that, but what they remember is not the good performer, um, and so forth. And I come back to what we mean by good here a bit later. Um, watching a theatre rehearsal, I, I pick that out because there's a very strong thing uh, within them about wanting to learn how it's done, if you see what I mean. That being a key thing they want to get out, out of the process. Um, and actually learning things is what they really want uh, to get out of the process. Um, and therefore, somebody talking about actually this was going to the Globe Theatre in London, but they saw a rehearsal and that was much more interesting than the performance as they began to understand how theatre is put together. And that process of learning how things are done is really important. And it comes in again about meeting film professionals and learning how things are made is often more interesting than watching the film itself. And those processes of learning about things, uh, they really like. Any thoughts and comments so far? That's all what you'd expect. <laughs> OK. I'm going to go through the workshops um, uh, uh, bit by bit, because each one of the workshops was different and kind of separate issues came out. Again, I realise these are small groups of children doing individual workshops. And in bringing questions out from that, they are genuinely questions. You are much more experienced. Um, and I'm kind of going, this, is, this issue raises that question. Um, the, um, when doing the workshops, and this is some of uh, Maria's work um, here, is that reflection was a very, very important part and very structured. And therefore, you did a workshop. Um, and then after that, there was a lot of discussion. And I think that what, by showing you the kind of scoring that we were doing, is that we were trying to get the young people to have a rounded view of what a successful workshop is, if you see what I mean. To move behind, oh, I, beyond I had fun, to go, well, what, what is fun? And what are the different levels of what you want to get out of a workshop? And how did that score? Um, so I won't go through the scorings, uh, the detailed scorings of all of them, but it's to give you a flavour of the way that the information was being extracted um, here. The, so this was a, a sketching workshop um, in which the uh, uh, artist uh, came in with this uh, pink tiger uh, outfit. Uh, and uh, a young person could dress up in, in the outfit and then went into various poses and uh, the children then sketched, the young people then sketched. And then the artist uh, went around them looking at their sketches and, and so forth. It was very, Kokis is a very rapid way of sketching, gave a lot of uh, feedback uh, which the children, the young people appreciated and um, 
and then they would move they would move on in the process and you can see that they the they were very positive about getting positive feedback because they got it um they didn't think it was too childish. They liked about the fact that they were able to participate um, there. They liked the fact that they learned something from being able to do it and so forth. I'd like to experience something similar again. On the whole, uh, they, really, they really did um, do that. Um, the, there were a significant number who did not want to draw. Lots of people think I can't draw and so forth. In fact, most people have much better drawing skills than they think they do but it was interesting they were all willing to give it a try and at the end of it most of them said they'd do it again um, and I think a common theme that you get through this is actually how open young people are to new experiences um, they were things that constantly throughout these workshops they were being asked to do things that made them feel uncomfortable and actually they did it and they got over it, and they were actually willing to do it again. And it wasn't necessarily that they didn't feel embarrassed and stupid, is that actually they learned that that was okay as they went through. But they had various comments about it. Um, so given the way that it worked, only three of the pupils were able to try on the costume, and they all wanted to try on the costume, and so yeah. forth. Yes, and so, forth. so they thought that, that was a bit disappointing because they wanted to do that. And they, they would do the sketching for two or three minutes because it's a very fast thing, and then the artist would go round um, uh, and talk to each person and talk about their things. And so there were these long pauses when nothing was happening, um, and so forth. And it was fairly obvious to the young people just commenting upon this is that the workshop could have been designed better. You could have come in with three costumes, divided them into three groups. Um, the, and in that particular case, having the groups uh, going on in parallel sessions but at slightly different times, that group could be sketching whilst you were talking to that group about their drawing and then that group could be getting dressed up and ready to do it. And in that process, all the kids would have got to try on the costume. There wouldn't have been these long pauses in between. Um, uh, and so forth, and the young people would have been um, busy virtually all the time, and it would have just hugely increased their pleasure in it. And the thought which um, came out of this, and you could see it in some of the other uh, workshops as well, is they could be much better if they were better designed. It's, it's, they're almost there, and you just kind of go, okay, can we just talk about how you're actually going to run this workshop? And with small amount of tweaks, would actually uh, uh, be, become a much, a much richer experience um, for the young people. So that was a question that sort of began to come out of these processes, is could there be better training for the, wor for the, um, for the workshop leaders so they have a wider set of skills when they're designing these things? What do you think? <laughs> I mean, I, th I think one of the things is that you have much more experience of, of um, cultural rucksack. And through this discussion today, what we're trying to do is to filter out, oh, yeah, you know, I could see that in that case, but generally I think this is okay. Or generally I think there could be more uh, training for people running workshops in workshop design. <laughs> ideas about it as well absolutely yes yeah yeah I, I, I think teachers would would be able to help um, quite a lot I think that's right um, the it's so hard everybody said in this process getting the teacher time um, in this and even if you're working with the cultural coordinator um, the and, and getting them to do that. I know that, uh, I mean, a constant theme from the teachers that ca came out, the cultural coordinators, is it's a lot of extra work for no extra money and very little respect from the school for having done it, if you see what I mean. And I know that the Rick's Music thing did a survey and one of the questions they, of the cultural coordinator, one of the questions they asked is, would you like more information 
beforehand so you can better prepare? And they said no. And I said, well, of course they didn't, because the question is, would you like a lot more work for no extra pay? Yeah. To which the answer is, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> so so the, it's, it's kind of going, well, you're getting the answer you would expect. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't happen, if you see what I mean. But you are, you are running up against um, a problem um, there. Um, textile artist workshop. So this was a workshop which had been created by a local museum to accompany a national tour of a major exhibition by a Norwegian textile artist. So the tour comes in at a national level, is hung, and then the local museum offers through the DKS a workshop. The workshop consisted of a lecture about the textile artist concerned by a member of staff, essentially. The interactive elements of the workshop promised in the marketing materials never happened. The, so the marketing material said, you know, there's a thing and it'll be interactive and I'll do this and so on and so forth. So when the artist brought the children <laughs> there, that, that was missing. <laughs> and the artist said to the person running, what happened to the interactive thing? They said, oh, they, we tried it and it led to the children misbehaving, so we stopped <coughs> doing it. Um, and it it raises a, a question about recognising their responsibilities to young people. I mean, the, if an adult went to a theatre to ha see something and it simply wasn't presented, you would go and go, that's completely unacceptable. I don't care what problem you had, that's what you promised to be able to do. But when a child is taken and is actually given, is not given what's promised, it doesn't seem to cause the same concern to the cultural institution um, there. Um, and again, the question is uh, of how common that is, because certainly through this process, we got the feeling that uh, it was all right to change and not do what you promised, if you see what I mean, well, uh, within the process. Um, and again, uh, in the textile artists um, workshop, uh, there was um, kind of detailed scoring um, here. Um, the, and you can see uh, that uh, the, the children uh, and young people were less positive um, about it. Um, the, what you do see, and I think this is very common with young people, is that actually it's quite hard to make young people be negative about things completely. They will tend to, to be positive. So here you see a lot of, well, maybe... Uh, would I like to experience something similar again? But after having done this part of it, then um, they, uh, another p part of the exercise here was uh, how much did you really like it in summary, now that you've, you've added it all on. The middle line is, is yes, uh, is, is the middle. Up there is I liked it, down there is I didn't. And you can see between the two, it's pretty marked as to what the overall um, impact of that um, was. Um, so, then another workshop they went to was uh, the Nutcracker. And it, this wasn't a workshop, they went to the performance of the Nutcracker. Um, these, as you know, were teenagers and the, um, uh, the, this particular performance of the Nutcracker was uh, aimed at a, at a younger group than them. And on the whole, they were uh, very conscious of that. Um, the, what was interesting to me here is that when, you, uh, when we talked to the young people in the opening sessions, they tended to be quite negative about theatre. You know, theatre was something that they didn't really want a lot of and felt wasn't going to be for them. But actually, when they were taken to this performance, uh, even though it was younger than them, out of the various workshops that they sampled from the DKS um, portfolio, if you like, this was the one they liked the most. They had the, the best time at. Um, they, uh, they liked the quality of the actors. Um, they thought it was very well focused on the target group. They really liked the fact they were real children playing the children in the part, not adults. It would have been boring if only adults were playing. It was entertaining. Something happened all the time. They made good contact with the audience and so forth. And therefore, even though it was theatre, even though it was aimed at, a, at an age younger than them, they could go there and have a really good time. And again, it's that thing of being cautious um, 
about them saying, oh, you know, we don't really want theatre, when uh, actually the right theatre done in the right way, even for different audiences, they will enjoy um, perfectly and they can see, they can see the point of. Um, so that's my interpretation as to why they were negative about theatre, but when they saw theatre, they were actually happy with that. Um, it also seemed to be a very engaging uh, production. So there was then another workshop. Um, the, which was a junk music workshop. So these are percussionists. They come in with a lot of uh, percussion instruments they've made out of junk, and uh, they, uh, they would normally... Um, give a straightforward performance um, on these. This particular case, um, the, the artist met with the young people a week before the concert to brainstorm ideas about how the concert experience could be improved for them. So looking at what this particular uh, group did, thinking about what they were looking from a cultural experience, um, they came up with some ideas. Um, these ideas were forwarded to the performers. But the performers, knowing at the time they were first approached that they would be expected to respond to young people's ideas, chose to ignore them. Um, so when the performance actually happened, they just turned up and did their normal workshop. And at the end, there was a four or five minute period when uh, the pupils could come up and could uh, play um, on, on it. And that was what the young people actually thought was best. And the... It, again, it raised this question, and it goes back to th this, the attitude towards young people um, here, is that it was fairly clear what was being expected of them, but there didn't really seem to be a willingness to engage with that and um, to respond to that. And that, therefore, in the way in which uh, performers and other artists and DKS are involved in... Um, uh, working here, should there be a more specific requirement for performers to actively seek to engage their audiences? Now, it may be that in, that in the case of DKS, you think it's already there, <laughs> that it has been made explicit, and, the, and then the question becomes, are, are the performers and the artists actually responding to that? Uh, or are they, have they got their performance, they know what they want to do, they turn up and they'll, they'll deliver that. And they don't really want to work outside that particularly. Yes? It might, it might be. I think it's a fair point to make that. And to me, that then goes back uh, to the training element um, about this is that actually they could be given better training to do that. And again, going back to the point about working with the teachers is that because of the pressure on teacher time, it might be more effective to actually train them separately in engagement, if you see what I mean. Um, but also, um, it's an issue which comes up with the young people quite constantly which is actually the ability of performers to engage. Um, the, but I'll, I'll come back to that um, a bit further on. Okay, so we've just been looking at a, a number of workshops where um, the, we'd, we were sampling, if you like, uh, DKS offers which existed and consuming them in a normal way and then ref yes sorry please just question do you see some reason for why this question uh, pops up linked uh, to music especially is it something about music performances or the way they are trained or the um, I don't I don't want to say it's particularly uh, linked to music because I think the two um, a d the two previous workshops that I was talking about, the textile artist, you know, saying, well, I, it's going to be interactive, but then not bothering, if you see what I mean, is that I think it's all connected um, with that. I think the textile artist workshop, if that member of the museum staff delivering it had better training, the fact that what she'd originally 
done hadn't worked wouldn't have made her stop. She would have thought, I'd better try something else. And I've got other ideas until I'd, I'd come up with the right thing. So I think it works across um, all of them. The, I think uh, that the, the DKS is quite strongly associated with music, though, because there's a high quantity of it coming through. And therefore, it's more likely that they're going to say it about music because they remember more music events um, than, than other things that they're, they're done. Um, so, uh, th these are then some workshops which the artists did, which they designed uh, themselves um, to see whether the experience could be packaged in a different way. Um, so, this was uh, a visit to an art gallery to see some pictures. What the artists did was got all the young people into the uh, art gallery, and then said, I want you to walk around on your own and choose a painting or picture that you really like and then write a description of it and then come back here when you've finished. So they all go around, find the paintings that they like, write descriptions of them, the, and then they come back. And then the artist took the descriptions and gave them to other people and said, right, working only from the description, now draw the painting or drawing that it describes. And so they worked hard on that for a period of time. And then the artist took the picture away and gave it to a third person and said, now go and find the, pi the picture or painting <laughs> in the museum. <laughs> um, and, uh, and off they went. Um, the, uh, they absolutely loved it. They, in the final session when they had the picture, they went around that gallery so slowly, looking at the pictures really carefully to try and work out whether this was the picture that they were, they were talking, uh, um, whether they were talking about. Um, they said it was the best experience they ever had in an art gallery. Um, the, and from my point of view, they were doing what they were supposed to do in an art gallery, which is look at the pictures and really take in what was going on. Um, and, um, and as they said, it, it taught us to be observant and to look at pictures properly. It was a two and a half hour workshop just to go through the whole of that process. And they scored it eight out of 10. Um, the, and again, the, uh, it comes back to the same question, which is there are hundreds of ideas like this out there, which could completely transform uh, an, uh, an experience in, in a gallery which aren't difficult to do and aren't avoiding the issue, if you see what I mean. One of the things that I'm very critical of in a lot of English uh, museums now is that actually, they, if you can imagine learning being up there and entertainment being up there, is that the, what you're trying to do is something which is in the middle but doesn't lose the learning. And very often in some of our museums now, it's just become entertainment. You push buttons, you pull levers and so on and so forth. You have your photograph taken in front of the steam engine with the man in the old fashioned uniform. And you go, well, what have you learned about anything? But here, I genuinely think the young people were engaging with the pictures uh, in that process. So it hadn't undermined the seriousness of what you were trying to achieve. Um, but um, it, uh, it, it, it really uh, meant a lot for them. Um, and then they did a Meet the Critic workshop. So, again, th this is a literary critic. So it was a critic from a newspaper. Um, so, obviously, through D DKS, there's quite a lot of writers um, coming into school and talking about their work. It's part of what they do. So this was quite a different angle. Um, and... Again, uh, the young people really liked it uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, they said she was reflective, giving and listening. She was interested in our opinion. It was not too long. In fact, this was a two hour workshop talking to a literary <laughs> critic, but they kind of didn't notice that. It put my brain in action. I'm changed for life. <laughs> I like the honesty about the fact that some books are rubbish. It's inspired me to read again. I'd never thought about books like this before. It gave me new ways to think, useful for my school subjects. She read an insane amount and had a lot of knowledge. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> um, now, if you go back to uh, what the children said doesn't make a good 
um, uh, cultural experience, I think they would have put meeting for two hours with a literary critic at the top of their list of what they'd like to avoid. <laughs> yes. um, but here you have somebody um, who is able to come in and do that and over a two-hour workshop get young people to start saying those kind of things about books. And in many ways, isn't this the ambition for the DKS? That you go in there and that you get uh, uh, young people thinking about things and actually inspired to go on and pursue it. The books we, were given, we are given to read at school, we are told to like. Here we could have an honest discussion about what we like and don't like and why. Um, the, th this to me was a really interesting point, which I've thought about a lot since these young people said it. Um, in the cultural sector, we tend to have developed all these narratives to tell ministers why doing culture is really great. And one of the ones we go is it leads to critical thinking, independent learners, and so on and so forth. And you go, oh, that's absolutely wonderful. We like critical thinking and independent learners. And then you look at what's happening in school, and that's happening in school. There is a canon of great books you have to study, and you have to like them. And if you don't like them, then somehow you failed that process. How is that developing critical thinking and independent learning? And the children are exposing it in this process and saying what the critic was doing was letting us have ideas. And through the ideas, we then started to think about what we liked and so on and so forth. And you were getting criti critical thinking and independent learning, and it was the counterpoint. The other thing that I would um, say about that critic, if you went back, um, is uh, actually that just describes good teaching to me. That's what a good teacher should be like. Um, the, um, this thing about interested in our opinion it, the, it, almost always when you're looking at good teachers, uh, they have a relationship with their children, a real relationship. And you cannot have a relationship if you have no idea what your children think, if, you're not, if they're not part of the conversation. That's what the relationship actually is. And therefore, that ability, even if, that, that, the ability to look interested in people's opinions, to create space for them to, to express their opinion, is fundamental to all good learning. If that's not in the class, that good learning won't be taking place, um, and so forth. Um, and, the, and so, really, she was giving a master class in uh, uh, good literature um, lesson teaching. Yes? Uh, uh, can I just yes, please, yeah. Right, so, <laughs> <laughs> which is very depressing. <laughs> when, when, but I think it's really interesting hmm. because in our, in our way of talking of the cultural rucksack, we, we really like stress the point it should be a professional artist, professional artist, professional artist. And, and, and why is that so important if hmm. this hmm. actually leads to a bigger interest for hmm. art and culture? Yeah. The, absolutely. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Mm. Well, I'm just thinking that just as important as being a professional artist is also being a professional, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, communicator. Yes, mm. absolutely. So it's not enough to be a professional artist if mm. you are a rubbish communicator. Mm. But I agree. Yes.
Yes, sir. Yes, yes. It's not always you can get the director of them to come. Mm. If you have someone else to connect, you still able to speak about it. Yeah. Yes. And I think you should be better at, at doing that. To yes. Have, um, have yes. Uh, yes. yes. It's, I think you're absolutely right that all those points um, come home to me. Um, the one of the things uh, about the critic and, and the way she played this is she's not defensive about the books. I think one of the, where I'm really sympathetic with teachers is that I think a lot of teachers feel if I don't persuade these children to like this book, I have failed, if you see what I mean. And it creates this defensive desperation in, in the atmosphere, if you see what I mean. The, she didn't, she, she just said, these are my views, you can have different views, that's fine, if you see what I mean, and opens up this space where it's not the same kind of um, uh, pressure. One of the things, this is what Vera was thinking about, because when I uh, met her a couple of weeks ago to talk about this, the, um, the children were a bit cynical about the motives for some of the writers in coming into school. Um, which were largely to sell my book, if you see what I mean. And obviously, within the context of selling my book, it doesn't really open up the opportunity for a lively critical discussion about is the book any good or not, if you see what I mean. Okay, and th th so that space is closed down. And that's obviously the space the young people really engage with um, and so forth. And therefore, they're kind of going, oh, yeah, we're not really going to be able to have uh, much of a say. Here. And therefore, you need the kind of writer who's got the confidence to have their book not liked. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. And that, I mean, I think that's fantastic. Um, the to to be able to put those skills in, and and I agree with you, and I think that one of the successes of this project is there was so much space for the children to critically reflect. And in the process of critically reflecting, they changed their views and were able to come to the view that they liked things they didn't think they liked, uh, that they saw things in very, very different ways, they understood themselves differently and so forth. And I think that is a, a key element um, in that. So I'd completely support what you're doing there. Oh, yeah, sorry. Mm. Uh, so it seems to me that this uh, issue there is important for all of the offices in the U.S. that we should take, uh, consider that um, they have the possibility to mm. be visible yeah. and to uh, state their opinion. Yes. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. Those two things are key, to be visible and state your, reflection, your opinions. And obviously that happens most in the reflection periods, if you see what I mean, because that's the point. There's really the time to bring that out. The, I don't think young people are abnormal in wanting to be visible and have the opportunity to state their opinions. Um, it's that, uh, because I think adults want that just as much um, in, in their lives. Um, but it's really important that they get that. I agree. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to comment on uh, the you were talking about the professional artists. So yeah. And I think it is necessary because mm. I think the artists have a um, kind of skill 
Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. The um. The. So d for me, I would tend to um, say. Uh, that the artists have a particularly powerful role to play in being able to do this. But not all artists can. Um, some do it naturally, brilliantly, that's fine. I think there's another category who can be trained to do it, and the training makes it. And then there's a category who's never going to learn how to do it. I mean, I tend to use the example of the British painter Lucian Freud, who's a fantastic painter, I mean, he's dead now, but to me was the greatest 20th century British painter. It was a complete waste of time ever sending him to a school to talk to young people. It just, it just wasn't ever going to work. What he wanted to do was to be in his studio 14 hours a day, painting what was in front of him in incredible meticulous detail for months after months after months. That's what he did as an artist, if you see what I mean. If you put him in front of a group of young people, nothing useful would happen except that he wouldn't be painting, which would be a shame because that's what we really wanted him to do. So I think it's recognising that this isn't work for all artists. The, and the fact that you are technically a, a wonderful artist doesn't mean necessarily you do this. That, as you say, uh, there's a big bulk of artists who could be a lot better at it if they got training, and there's some who we all know who are just absolute naturals uh, at being able to do it already. Um, Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Well, roles, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, 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 yeah, exactly, I agree, yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes, absolutely, did you want to say something, Vivian? <laughs> the, <laughs> I thought you were going to say something. No, the, so, this was a screenwriting workshop. Well, oh, sorry? Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that I, I don't think it's really a matter of compromise. Mm. Uh, it's just a matter of recognizing that there's a unique skill set that we need to be looking for. Yes, for yes. The performers that we send out in yes. school. Yes, so, yes. You can be a brilliant musician. Yeah. Uh, and it's not difficult to find a setting mm. in which a brilliant musician is no longer. Yes. <laughs> able to perform at their best. Absolutely. And in some in some cases, the school yeah. is uh, an area where a performer cannot be at their best. Yes, absolutely. While others mm -hmm. who may be completely unsuitable for yes. a lot of other arenas yes. are absolutely perfect yes. for that setting. Yes. So I think mean, it's important to have that discussion yes. about what kind of skills are we really after mm -hmm. and uh, what kind of performers yes. are able and willing to mm. give mm. The, uh, the best performances and the best experiences. Yes, absolutely. I agree about that. And then who assesses that so that it is part of the assessment yeah. and selection process? Absolutely right. Um, this was a screenwriting workshop. Uh, sorry? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, a very short comment. Uh, because mm. I also used a writer in my uh, group. And um, she was very engaging and has a background as a teacher. And mm. uh, she was uh, teaching uh, creative uh, writing skills. Mm. And I asked her if she, she had done any work with the DKS. I know she works a lot in different schools as a mm. private uh, business. Mm. But uh, she said she, she couldn't get uh, anything to do in the DKS because she hasn't written a book yet. <laughs> so, mm. and, um, so that was the yes. Argument yes. That, yes. That That's an interesting point. Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Um, so this was a screenwriting workshop. Um, and I, I just thought that the, uh, the, the, the exercises he went through uh, were really interesting. Um, he started off um, by uh, showing them the opening sequence of the film. And then he had the actual script of the film. And he said, this is what it looks like when you write it as a script. And they all looked through that in, in, in detail and looked at the film uh, that uh, they were, um, that they just worked, worked and, and worked it out. Um, he then did an exercise with them in which he gave them the opening uh, couple of pages of a novel. Um, and then they had to work in small groups and write the script the, for that opening. The, and they all did that. And then he had the film and he showed them a version of that film having been made. Um, so they could then compare their efforts um, with that. And he then moved on to give them um, uh, a small, uh, a small, a short story, and divided up the pages between groups, and then everybody had to uh, do a um, storyboard script for each one of the pages, and then they ended up with a complete film, um, short film in script form that they were able to do. Um, the, they absolutely loved um, doing that. It gave them a really good, in a very short amount of time, a quick introduction to filmmaking, script writing, and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of what they did. And it was, you know, it was fun to learn about the script. None of us had ever seen a real script before. Giant fun to learn about film. This I want to learn more. Interesting and uh, educative. Um, fun to use the imagination. The, it's such a simple technique for teaching literature. This <laughs> and getting people, because that, so often with literature, you come to terms with what you're reading when you try and translate it into something else. And therefore, this process of translation is a very deep process of learning about something. And therefore, translating into film, and then being able to see the film and come back to the book and so on and so forth. The, um, it just seems such a simple technique for really engaging them both in the art form um, and in the literature that they uh, were trying to work with. Um, and, the, and these are kind of uh, techniques in a lot of ways that you'd say it would be great to see more of this being used in, in ordinary class, if you see what I mean. It doesn't necessarily need a film uh, maker to be able to come in and do this. Teachers with the right materials could easily take young people through these processes and make it come alive. To me, it'd be really interesting if you were doing this and extended, is then to have gone on and made the film they'd scripted, if you see what I mean, which I think they would have really enjoyed as well. Um, and, the, and I think particularly in this age range, um, the, uh, the filmmaking skills seem to be very strong because uh, of mobile phones and videos and computers and so on and so forth. They have that visual uh, literacy already and they're able to put that together very well. And we've just seen that very recently in a creative partnerships project in Opland um, with two amazing films made by children um, in a special school um, there, but which were uh, really fantastic. Um, so it, it just seems to me there's a natural way of integrating all this in. It may not necessarily need D, D, DKS, if you see what I mean, but then DKS could be over on the top of that. Um, and then they did a theatre workshop. And this theatre workshop, it so happened that the creative professional uh, who did this did it both in Opland and in Ors, um, and uh, completely blew the kids away. Uh, in, in both places. So he's theatre director who specialises in improvised theatre. Um, it was doing a lot of workshop um, techniques um, and exercises which was beginning to um, uh, draw them out of themselves um, and so forth. Sven, Eric and I, when we were talking about, was, talked to, to them, were they just having fun? Were they learning anything about theatre? And the, what... Van Eric was very convincing about in, in terms of his answer about this, is that the, he said what this director really helped the children understand is the difference between acting as an ensemble on stage and delivering a script. 
So you know, delivering a script is you've got the lines, you learn them, you get up on stage and you give them, if you see what I mean. But what theatre gives you is this live interaction of, uh, uh, of people on stage and that there is so much more to the meaning they communicate in their body language, in their tone, in their positioning on stage and so on and so forth. All those things add up to make theatre so much greater than the delivery of the lines, if you see what I mean. And the, these workshops were particularly good at getting the young people to understand the dynamics and workings of those processes. Um, but they said at the end, I learned about identity. I discovered how my brain works, a ground course in letting go, easy for everyone to be part of. I laughed myself to <laughs> death. A lot to bring to my daily life. I learned about making a fool of myself and I liked it. I could definitely do more in school. <laughs> I want to be part of <laughs> They, actually, there were other lines in which they said, I bet adults couldn't do this. <laughs> in, in terms of doing it. The, it was interesting to me that the kids were so blown away by this. And I was wondering what people thought, without actually having seen them at work, what the, what the key elements were. Mm. I'll come to that at the uh, end. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, now, this, th th this was a small workshop, but it's interesting. This is the same group who went and had that um, visit to the art gallery in which they, they wrote the things and so forth. What the artist did at the end is bring an art critic in to tell them about the paintings they'd selected. And it was a fairly straightforward lecture but they were really interested because they were their painting. That's what, that's what they felt about. And they now had an ownership of these paintings. And when he talked about who the painter was and what the background was, they were just 100% attention. That, that was really interesting. And that converting it into being your music to being my music is the core trick that we're really trying to get happen. And therefore, again, uh, you could go back to doing something which is as mundane uh, as the art historian coming in, and yet you then had the attention and they were willing to engage in it um, and so forth. Um, the percussion workshop, the, the, it's, it's quite hard to describe this if, unless you have a long conversation with Sven Eric and you've seen some of the videos. Um, but what this artist does, I think, is really extraordinary in terms of breaking movement down um, and getting people uh, to become percussive instruments, if you like, and then how they work as a per percussive percussion ensemble, all of them working together, um, and so forth. And there was lots and lots of things the young people um, said about this. Um, because it, it really was very powerful for them. And again, you know, it was a lot about letting go. It was again about making a fool of yourself and it not, if, it not mattering. But again, it seemed to me to getting into the heart of what music is about and how music functions at really quite a high level, highly sophisticated level, but in the context of a workshop which was, um, uh, which was a lot of fun and, and very engaging. But I particularly picked out these comments, which came from the reflection in, in the young people here, is that they, they, what they were doing would get progressively more complicated and Lars would keep introducing new rules. And then the final rule was that there weren't to be any rules anymore and you could do what you wanted and that nobody could do that. <laughs> nobody could actually break outside the rules. Um, and that then led on to a really rich conversation with the young people about creativity and rules and the need to go outside the rules, but how hard that really is to do and uh, the kind of personal risks that you need to do to be able um, to get out there. Um, so it wasn't about breaking rules for the sake of breaking rules, if you see what I mean, is they understood the importance of rules and yet where you could break them to really enhance um, something and where that is the essence of creativity and so much I mean I think particularly when you're listening to music um, the 
I mean, certainly almost the formation of all my favourite classical music of people like Bach is about setting up rules and breaking them. And, that, and he just does that better than everybody else. Um, but it's without the setting up of the rule, you'd never get the pleasure you get from the moment that he breaks it. And them then being able to explore this in this kind of sense, I think gives them the opportunity to come much more, cl much deeply closer to understanding what music really is and how it operates on you, then often you can get uh, from listening to a hundred concerts, if you see what I mean, in, the, in that process. So I'd, I thought it was um, a really engaging way of working. Um, the uh, photography, there was a, a great photography workshop. Um, the uh, again, there was uh, plenty of opportunity for the young people to engage in this process. They took a lot of photographs. This is actually a photograph taken by one of the young people in the workshop. Um, the uh, photography is very close to, to young people because they're doing it all the time. Therefore, they already have a language which is, uh, which is quite easy to build upon and take on. But how quickly, when working with a photo professional photographer, they then began to understand what it was that that photographer was doing that they weren't able to do and to respect and appreciate the difference there. And this is the poetry workshop um, that uh, Sven Eric was just talking about. Um, they actually th here got them talking about emotions and writing very sim sim simple statements about emotion anger is, fear is and so forth and they, they could choose certain words to do and then he, he grouped them according to which um, uh, emotion they had wanted to do so if they were doing anger he'd get them all together and they'd each written four or five statements and then just going down the line with each person saying one of their lines, you suddenly got poetry, very powerful poetry, being able to come through. And this is where um, the children said, sorry about the typing mistakes here. In school, we get asked to write poems, but we don't know how to. Here we learn some techniques, which is actually, they began to again see uh, the construction, uh, how poetry is constructed and the different elements of it. Um, the, I was going to sh show you, there's an vi interesting video clip um, of this, but the sound is too uh, quiet where they're doing this, going down the line, reading their, thing, their things out. What I think is so interesting about watching the video is they haven't stopped being embarrassed and awkward about it. But st because this is really uncomfortable territory for teenagers, emotions, poetry, you know, you kind of thing. They, and yet they're doing it. If they're sticking with it, they're engaging with it and they're getting a lot out of it. And th again, it's just coming back to, to this point about making it not embarrassing and not awkward isn't the solution in these processes. These things are, it's just facing up to it and then scaffolding, building scaffolding around the pupils in such a way to give them the confidence to go and do it. And as said, that, that their whole body language was kind of giggly and a bit awkward and so forth. But you could tell they were getting a huge amount out of having gone through um, that experience. So summing up their learning um, a little bit here, <laughs> um, the, so the, the, through that you can see through the um, the process of the discussions that uh, they they've moved to a slightly different space. Um, they want to be able to participate, okay, um, but we know that they're just as happy listening to a lecture in which they're not participating if it's brilliantly done. The, the, they're now moving on to more theatre and plays. Whilst they were going, they didn't really want theatre and plays to begin with, uh, but they only want good ones. Less museums, but if we have to have musicians, they should be fun. <laughs> yes. uh, the less singing concerts, but it's important that the, sing the singers are talented and have charisma, and get in contact with the audience without it being clapping the rhythm, <laughs> which, which I liked. Um, the, Get visits from people who know a lot about a subject that we're studying. Get surprise visits. Get visits from people who show a huge engagement commitment to a subject. Let the experiences be positive, but with a connection to schoolwork. It's a very constant theme. That we, uh, all they said is they want to learn things from these experiences, and they want the learning to be connected with the learning that's going on in school and not disconnected. And they see that as being central to what they mean by quality in this process. Um, the, I kind of think that 
what this kind of says to me is that by the end of this process, they'd all been persuaded that all these things can be good experiences. Um, so, you know, whilst they were saying, oh, uh, uh, you know, we don't really want to do this, we don't really want to do that, they're all going, actually, but we know this can be fun <laughs> if it is done um, in the right way. And I think it comes back to what you were saying over there, which is about uh, training and development of people and assessing them to make sure that they're good at doing these things. Um, better quality concerts, and I'll come to the quality in a moment. More famous people. Now, th this is really interesting, and it was in Sven Eric's group that I really liked. He set up uh, the final workshop in a way in which he said, the f when he started the whole process, he said, the final workshop, you can do whatever you want. You decide the artists that you want um, to bring in, you contact them and get them to come, then that's it. So they all got together, they came up with things and uh, tried to contact them. Um, and because they all chose terribly famous people, uh, the, none of them were free <laughs> and couldn't come. And so then Sven Eric had this conversation with them and said, yeah, well, you know, people like that aren't going to be free at relatively short notice to come in and do a workshop in a school. And they said, but those are the only people we know. We only know famous people. And it was a very interesting take on the, what would you like, Justin Bieber? Okay. So you know. Well, actually, they say Justin Bieber because they know Justin Bieber. They'd probably be happy with lots of other people if they knew the other people. The point is they don't know the other people, but they, and they don't know who to trust in that process. And therefore, they're quite open about saying, well, the reason we always mention these famous people who we know is it's because all we know. <laughs> you know that, that's our problem. We're young um, and experienced. And therefore, I think they recognise, and I think working with the artists, um, in this process, they recognised there were good people who they really would enjoy. Um, but their feeling was uh, that they weren't necessarily um, getting them. Um, the, they were quite vociferous, and again, you've mentioned this, about the natures of the venues and this big events with lots of people. I mean, they talk about the fact of how difficult it is to have fun if you're sitting in the school gym and there's a whole lot of boys behind you making sarcastic comments all the way through the concert. Yeah, it's not going to be a quality experience for anybody if that's what we do. Um, and that's a challenge that we have to face up to, if you see what I mean. And I think you were referring to that, that... Um, that um, uh, that's a problem. How do we want to do it? They loved working in these small groups. They loved working in cross-phase groups, i.e. children of different ages. And from talking to all the artists, they were very comfortable doing that. Sometimes, I mean, across the age range we were doing of, you know, 10 and 11 to 18, there can be quite a lot of social tension, if you like. But actually, in these workshops, they got over that very quickly. They listened to each other, they trusted each other, and they liked that. Now, the teachers say... Uh, that they're very reluctant to book things which only work with a small part of one class or one class out of a whole year and so forth. Because what do I do with everybody else? How do I explain to everybody else they can't do it? And so the, there's got to be a balance um, between what the pupils are saying, which is uh, smaller groups is better. With that actually means sending a team of artists in on the same day. So at least the whole year can work in smaller groups doing interesting things, if you see what I mean. And they can perhaps rotate through them. But this working out what's the best way of delivering the experience is key. This not being punished for going to DKS came up a lot. This is when they talk about going to it. This is, we're always punished if we go on DKS. This is what you mean. So the teachers all give us extra work. And it's much more work than if we'd actually been in class. But they go, well, since you're away on Tuesday afternoon, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. So they just feel they're punished for doing it. It's like, well, it's just not worth it because we're going to get this mountain of extra work to do um, out of it. And that seems to me a way... I mean, the cultural coordinators talk about being unappreciated and the fact they're seen as an intervention, stealing school time, I think was quoted um, to us. And that the teach other teachers then reflect that back to the pupils and go, right, if you're going to do DKS, you're going to suffer, if you see what I mean. And, it, and it's the words the pupils use. We're punished for doing DKS. Uh, and so forth. And as you go up in school and the, the pressure of exams gets bigger and the amount of what you're doing gets bigger, it becomes more and more. So, of course, it builds in huge resistance from uh, the young people to actually want to do it. And they also, in one of the groups, um, 
raised this, I think it was Fanet's group again, they raised this really interesting um, point about gender-specific offers. So why do you think that boys and girls want the same thing? Um, and I actually think they've got a really interesting point here. I mean, when my initial reaction is, is oh, I don't want to have gender-specific things. But you can, you know, when kids below the age of 12, there isn't a lot of gender specificity. I mean, some children will show it more than others, but they play together, they fight together, they're similar size and look and all that kind of thing. They get into the teenage years and it is the, year when you, it's the years when you are most different. Boys and girls are most different from each other. And then after that, we all get back to being more or less the same again. By the time we're 80, we're indistinguishable. So it's the thing. But it is a period where gender specificity is enormously uh, intense in their lives and yet there's the assumption that we can make a cultural offer uh, to them uh, which doesn't take that into account um, and I kind of go I think this is something which needs thinking about I think it's a really interesting point um, it would certainly I think do something to be able to unpick the unhappy people in the back making the sarcastic comments you'd feel freer in the spaces that you'd chosen um, to be in uh, and so forth. And um, I thought it was really interesting. One of the groups, and this is one of Maria's <laughs> groups, because <laughs> she'd asked them to do a perfect recipe, and I just loved this. Um, one of the things that we talked about, Vera and I, when we were first thinking about this process, was if we took the young people through a process of thinking about these things and feeding into this consultation and giving us stuff to think about. Whether they could be given the opportunity to go further and design something. And this group in particular, I thought, to have the opportunity to work with two or three artists to say, okay, in real terms, what would that look like? Um, have another three or four sessions when you can kind of try and work it out would be really interesting because I think it would delve deeper, dig deeper into some of the issues. But anyway, I just thought it was just beautiful. Um, overriding themes, better quality, and this feeling which we get to at the end is we like anything if it's good, actually, and the importance of engaging your audience. More training for practitioners, we've talked about, but better connection with school and learning, more passion and commitment, Involved teachers, this was a really important point because both the teachers and the young people talked about it. These are most powerful when the teachers are involved and having to do it too. Um, and best of all, if the teacher has to dress up and do something way outside their comfort zone, like we're expecting the young people to do, it builds much better and stronger long-lasting relationships in class. And both the teachers and the pupils felt that. And more influenced by young people. I mean, they, they are, I think, relatively wise about the limitations of their knowledge. Hence, we only know famous people, if you see what I mean. They're, they're honest about that. But they, they, this lot certainly felt they would like to be more involved in the decision-making processes about what was going to come and so forth. And certainly, um, from what I got from talking to the artists, all of them would make a significant contribution. Again, I would say that if you were setting up in groups, in groups, if you were going to do this in school, I'd set up groups in school who were able to work closely with the cultural coordinator and I'd give them training <laughs> so that you didn't, so they ended up where these kids ended up, not where the kids were at the beginning, if you see what I mean, with, with some sense of what was going on. I think it would help in lots of ways, but one of the things is those young people would mark it the offer more powerfully in school um, because they've been involved in that process. So I said I'd talk a bit about defining quality. Um, I was at a conference last week in Amsterdam about this, refreshing my thinking about it. Um, this was one of the aspects of defining quality which one of the participants talked about which I really liked, which is understanding quality in three sections. Quality of input, the quality of the process, and the quality of the outcome. Um, now, the quality of the input is, I think, the side in which there has been a lot of focus. 
So are these professional musicians, professional actors, and so on and so forth, who, who know, th know their art form? Are we representing a good range of art forms here? Have we financed it adequately, and so on and so forth? And I think that's all the stuff that DKS has always taken extremely seriously and said, those bits, we tick the box. But what the children and young people talk about is actually, when they, um, when they talk about quality, is, but you've got to remember the other two as well. And that then brings up this whole question of venue, performance, the ability to engage with your audience, the ability to engage with this particular audience and to make the changes necessary to bring them in um, and so forth. The preparation, the follow-up that, that takes place um, in, in order to make that um, happen. And I think that the young people were much more conscious of the weaknesses of the quality of the process. Um, because that's what they saw more than they saw the quality of the input, because on the whole, they didn't see that. And then finally, the quality of the outcome is the memories. That comes through the reflection. Without reflection and real reflection, um, I don't think you get the long-term impact on the young people that you were looking for, um, and so forth, the, the taking away of memories. Now, the, I think that this lens of looking at quality is also helpful in other ways. You can choose the best possible performers, do it best, put it in a great venue um, with a wonderful engaging performance, but it just doesn't work for that person. That's always going to happen, if you see what I mean. But at least you're locating where the problem is, um, somewhere in your scale, and you've made sure that the bits you do have the capacity to address, uh, you have addressed. And I think it's that quality of process bit that the children, are, the children and young people are challenging as to whether that has been addressed um, enough. And that would, in a sense, be the areas in which the training would most focus on, although reflection, I think, is really important. Um, and these were some other interesting things um, which are worth, worth, worth thinking about. Um, the, we very often have the arguments about other oh, processes are really important stuff, so it doesn't matter about the product. To me, the product matters a huge amount. <laughs> yeah, but product, I mean, so in the sense that if you do a workshop with young people, at which at the out, at the, the, at the end, they produce a lot of stuff which is rubbish, that's not fair to the young people. Um, I remember being in a school in Sweden uh, looking at a project which was like this. So the concept of this project, they're working with 12 or 13 year olds and they had to make three dimensional maquettes um, representing three different kinds of love. Yeah? Love for my parents, love for my friends, love for my brothers and sisters and so on and so forth. So it was really intriguing. I mean, for me, because in England we don't talk about love because we get embarrassed about that kind of thing very easily. The, but the, um, here I thought that to, you know, to get 12 or 13 year olds to think about that was really interesting. The quality of what they did was terrible. And I thought that's such a shame that a decent artist had come in and worked with those children to help them express their ideas to a high standard, it would have been really transforming. But the kids kind of knew what they'd made wasn't very good. And therefore the product, whether it's the performance, whether it's the thing they make and so forth, is really important. But the process is really important as well. And a bad process doesn't, uh, doesn't get you to the product that you want um, in, in a useful way. And again, visiting a primary school in England, they told me that they'd done this uh, project with eight or nine year olds called the family meal. And the idea was that each child did a painting of a family meal. And it was a lovely way, they said, in which you, this was a very diverse school uh, in Nottingham of representing um, the, the differences between the many families that they have and kind of celebrating difference. And they then took me to see the exhibition. Every painting was exactly the same, which it was like that. The table was half of it, and then there was a mother, a father, and a child, and so forth. So somehow the art teacher had intervened and going, and this is how you draw the family meal, if you see what I mean, and taken out all the things. So the process had been completely undermined. So you've got to get a balance between that. And a balance between identification and distance, I think I could see from the comments that were coming back from the artists, the children and young people doing this quite well. We don't want actually completely us, and we don't want something we can't relate to at all. It has to exist in this in-between space where it's taking us outside of ourselves a bit, but not so far that we can't relate um, anymore. And I think that that's a really interesting um, challenge. 
and the balance between form and content, which I think is quite challenging in quite a lot of contemporary art practices. Learning with all the senses and reflection is what achieves the transfer effect. So that's code for actually the impact and benefit to the young people comes through the reflection process. If you don't have it, it's pretty unlikely they're really going to um, get the transfer benefits from having had that experience. And then finally, just uh, a reflection on some of our learning about learning. Um, we started off running a very big program in England called Creative Partnerships. It grew until it was working in about 2,500 schools in England every year. Uh, that's the program which attracts a lot of international attention. And then now uh, Creative Partnerships programs running uh, uh, here in Norway, in Sweden, in Lithuania, in Holland, in Germany, in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, in Pakistan, and so forth. And this has given us an opportunity to do a huge amount of research because we're very, very committed to research. And in particular, looking at what happens in the classroom that makes great learning. And the real driver of this was a, a piece by Nottingham, a big piece of research by Nottingham, research, Nottingham University called Signature Pedagogies. We'd already established from our research that young people who go through our programs do better in test results, are more motivated, have more confidence, behave better in class, and their parents are more engaged. And the question was, what is it about an artist in a classroom with young people that achieves the effect? And this became signature pedagogies. What are the signature pedagogies of artists? And that we have summarized um, in this slide. Um, what is a high quality learning environment and what we say is it's the high functioning classroom which is on the right hand side and on the left hand side is a more traditional style of education the just running quickly down the high functioning side you have the role of the teacher is yeah. sorry I mean, <laughs> the, the role of the teacher in terms of uh, setting challenges so the point of the teacher isn't to take you to answers but in order to allow you uh, to set challenges which all the young people can do that it feels very real it's authentic it feels relevant to your life the organization of time is very flexible the organization of space uh, is that what you have is focus on uh, on the activity not focus on the teacher uh, the approach to tasks is very, uh, very social. There's a lot of group work going on. What you do and what you come up with is highly visible. Everybody can see it. It's very physical and it's very mobile. And the self as a learning resource, your stories, your perceptions, what you can do is brought in and is absolutely central. Emotion and feelings is central to the whole process. They're not sidelined. It feels very inclusive. And the young people feel they're managing these processes. And this goes back to the question of uh, that theatre practitioner. His workshops are absolutely high-functioning workshops. Every one of those. He's constantly challenging the pupils. And one of the, one of the markers of a teacher who teaches like this is all the children are busy all the time. That, that's what's going on. In a traditional classroom, very often have you know, the teacher, you've got to wait whilst the teacher explains that again to so-and-so. There's these constant breaks and pauses. But um, there, it's always busy in, in that process. So the, you could see that his workshops were absolutely like that. Physical, group work, highly vis visible, um, very flexible in the way you're using time, emotions, and so on and so forth. And again and again, when you run learning experiences for young people like that, they love it. It is their idea of having a really good time. And our argument, which is the work that we do in schools, is to say most teachers could teach like that, not all the time, but most of the time. That, that is what they could do. And I think what was happening um, in these workshops just reinforced what we always say. Those workshops, which were high-functioning learning environments, physical, emotional, social, um, intellectually challenging, the children absolutely loved. And the ones that 
weren't able to do that and moved across to the low functioning ones are the ones which scored um, low. So there's nothing kind of magic about it in a sense. There are ways of creating learning environments. And therefore, if you're going to move on to train artists to do better workshops, this is what you'd be working from. You'd be looking at their practice and going, how do you put this into your practice? So that children are busy all the time. It's very physical. There's group work. Uh, it's visible, it's very engaging, and so on and so forth. And leave it to them to come up with the solutions. This is a diagnostic tool which enables them uh, to work out where they need to improve their practice in order to get the high levels of engagement and ultimately uh, enjoyment and learning um, from the young people. That's it. <laughs> I'm very happy with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ja. Vi har 40 minuter efter planen, men men det är er inte säkert vi trenger att bruka så mycket. Vi kan nu ta utgångspunkt i 20 minuter. Vi prövar se hur långt vi kommer i en diskussion. That's great. Um, jag ska bara vikla mig in i denna. Yes. We haven't actually uh, uh, decided how to do this. Yes. <laughs> it's just that uh, it would be very interesting to have a discussion with you about all these findings. But first, can I ask you, like in, in public, <laughs> the same question I asked you. Uh, could you kind of translate, since most of, of the offers in the cultural rucksack mm -hmm. is not workshops, yes. but uh, encounters with uh, in different sorts. Yes. Um, how would you translate this uh, uh, thing of quality, the slide that you showed us? How, how do you kind of translate that into the meetings? Um, yes, D where did I put my control? There we go. Did you mean that one? Yes, I meant that one. Um, I mean, since it's the discussion of high quality, yeah. Is this suitable in some sort of, I mean, can we use this one for also the, like the brief encounters that they have? The, um, so, the, what I would say is if you, if you're three musicians and you turn up uh, to perform a 45 minute concert, right, um, and that's all you're going to do. You, uh, it is going to be almost by definition more low functioning, if you see what I mean. I'm going to perform. You're going to sit there. It's not going to be mobile. There's no chance for conversation. Um, the so forth. Some parts of that are fine because you can't do music without emotion. M music is always about feelings, um, and so forth. Um, so what? What I then say is, okay, if you're less high functioning, you have to work harder to engage your audience. Mm. But you have to engage your audience, if you mm. see what I mean. And you go, it's going to be more difficult to do. Mm. Um, but clearly, wonderful performers just do it. They just have that stage presence that you're riveted uh, by the t when they, they come out. And it, I think it is that notion of... Uh, stage presence and connection with your audience that I think most people know is there mm. um, very clearly um, from the start. Um, so the, I think you can use it uh, for ordinary performances. Um, was, that, was that a clear answer? Yeah, I, th I think there's also the process mm. of... Uh, yes. I think there's also the... Uh, the, the point of nonverbal uh, communication yes. in this. I often have talked to musicians about mm. their, uh, how to recognize their standing ovation yes. when they're in the school because clapping is traditional and yes. people team and, and uh, it's not difficult to get a, a gym full of children to clap yes. <laughs> or applaud. But if you've got uh, second and third graders coming up at the end of the concert mm. to talk to the performers mm. 
where they obviously have a, a confidence mm -hmm. in the performer, even though they've never really met them. They have the mm -hmm. feeling that they've mm -hmm. met them mm -hmm. that's been developed through 30 or 40 minutes of a concert performance. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, yes. so we always yes. kind of joke that, you know, if you've got yes. the kids coming up to you after the concert, yes. that's a really good thing. Yes. If Absolutely. you just have the teachers coming up <laughs> after the end of the concert, uh. you're yes. doing something wrong. Yes, mm. yes. Absolutely. And yes. <coughs> the, I think we need to discuss a lot more about the nonverbal behavioral yes. cues yes. that happen during a performance, yes. simply because we don't have the kind of verbal interaction that we have to mm. evaluate uh, workshop yes. formats when we're doing live performances. Yes, yes, absolutely. I am also very anxious to know about you. How uh, These findings, how do they relate to your reality and your experience and your thoughts of challenges and, and how the students respond to the cultural rucksack? <coughs> I, hate to say it, but, uh, I hate to say it, but the left-hand column mm -hmm. Uh, is going to be immediately recognizable to almost any classroom teacher mm. as the reality that the uh, national curriculum mm. and the mm. focus on testing mm. um, puts on them in their, in their daily mm. uh, work. I mean, mm. that very few teachers mm. working in uh, the elementary and, and middle secondary schools mm. would, s e even though they would want to be on the right-hand side, mm of that picture, uh, I think that most of them would agree that it would be unrealistic mm. for them to do it with the constraints that are put on them now. Mm. And that also brings us into the, the uh, point about going into the school on the school's own mm. premises mm. when the premises for the school are, are actually more in the direction of low functioning uh, mm. learning environments. Uh, uh, could, could you take us back to, to uh, the slide where you have uh, uh, the thoughts from, yes, before that as well. Uh, yes, uh, maybe this one or this one, yes. Because what I, I really wonder is how th the findings that you found in, in, this, in this research, how does it respond to your uh, thoughts of how the students meet the cultural rucksack? Is it... I mean, is this very different from, from what you think or what you have met with the students, or does it harmonize with your impression of how the children meet the cultural rucksack? Knut? Well, I think it's, I think it's basically what we're all trying to achieve. But as Scott says, mm. it's not always the everyday life of the school, the teacher, the students. Mm. So it's, it's a diversity there, and it, mm. that's where the complexity is. Mm. Mm. It's a challenge to, to be on the right-hand side mm. when, as Scott says, you are most of the time on the left-hand mm. side. And, and, uh, but it's, it's, I think it's, it's a, it summarizes pretty good mm. what we're trying to achieve. Mm. 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 Elizabeth? Yes, uh, I do agree on that. Um, and uh, I want to emphasize that um, the opportunity for uh, the, the artists and, and the teachers to meet more mm. Mm. Uh, as well in, uh, in the daily experience mm. and in their um, uh, university high schools, mm. for f mm. uh, it's of very great importance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a question of methods, much mm. of this, and I don't I don't think it's the left column is for the teachers. Mm. It's more not black and white. Mm. Mm. I think you find both there. Yeah. And yeah. I think you, you really explained that very mm. well mm. Mm. because uh, it's of important not to take the work away from the teacher. Mm. Mm. The teacher are available yes. to do uh, many of these things yes. you saw in, yes. in your yes. presentation. Yes. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. an arm here? No? I was thinking about the, uh, uh, the recommendations from the uh, uh, from the children's or the w the wish for from the children. I mean, uh, this this research and this material. I mean, we've been traveling around f in Norway for a year now, and this harmonized very much with the experience that when we ask students, "What do you want? What do you think of the program as it is?" Mm. 
what are your thoughts? This kind of deepens all the answers that we have. But they, like they said, for instance, they say, and they say here as well, please do not give us large concerts nine o'clock in the morning in the gymnastic hall because we don't want it. It's horrible. We don't want it. It's, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> but what do we think about that? I mean, if the children really don't want to have like large group concerts, which is what we are able to give them. I mean, wha what uh, uh, what does that make of our program? I mean, what the what are the consequences when the children say state these things? How do we address it? You have any <laughs> thoughts of that? We've been working with creative partnerships since 2011. Been around 500 pupils in our program. Mm. So, of course, my, my thought is that you need to start thinking about from the young people's point of view and the school's point of view and engaging them. That's where you need to start instead of thinking about what artists um, are, are we going to send around the country for mm. the concerts. I think you have to speak up because they can't hear you behind Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I've what, I'm s what I think is obviously you need to connect this to the learning, as this seems to be the clear message from the pupils. Mm. Connect it to the learning and connect it to the schools. Mm. So that they don't feel like this is something that another thing that is pulled over their head. Mm. It needs to be something that goes along with them and which is uh, um, part of the learning and part of the school's everyday mm. issues that they have. Mm. So that it's just engaging them more. Mm. Um, the, um, just reflecting on this uh, question about what happens in Norwegian schools. Oh, I've got a microphone on, didn't I? It's what happens in Norwegian schools. The, um, I remember one project that uh, Siri and her team did, which was working with grade five doing mathematics uh, in a primary school in Aarhus. Can um, you hear him? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, great, yes. And um, the... Uh, the project involved using mathematics to build this huge wooden construction in the middle of the school grounds. Uh, and, the, and they worked with a wood artist, a carpenter, um, and so forth, uh, to design and then build it, hammers and nails and saws and all the stuff. And I visited the school after the project, and I got there uh, early for the meeting, and happened to have this conversation with the head teacher on her own about it before everyone else was ready. And it was interesting because the, te the head teacher was quite sceptical about this uh, approach. Um, and so when the project was over, she got all the children in the class together on her own to ask them about it um, before we had a chance to, if, if you see what I mean. And she said it was really interesting because I asked them about this project. Did they like it? They loved it. They had a wonderful time. It was absolutely fantastic. And she said, so you like mathematics, do you? And they all said, no, we hate maths. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, but that was maths. And they said, no, maths is sitting and writing. And she said it was like a light bulb coming on in her head that we have made math sitting and writing. Math is nothing to do with sitting and writing. Math is all around us in our lives all the time and so forth. But we've reduced it to this narrow thing, narrow area. And of course, in the meantime, we've lost the interest of the young people in mathematics. And then we all wonder why they do so badly in mathematics and PISA comes out and we all beat ourselves up and so on and so forth. And it just comes back to the high functioning classroom. It's perfectly mm. possible to teach maths in a completely different way, which is entirely engaging. Um, and in s some ways, I think that you can see the, the pupils with some of the workshops that they did there going, God, if only my teacher knew how to teach like this. And you thought, well, actually, part of DKS can be to show, because teachers pick things up very quickly. And if they're involved in the workshops, then they go, this is really interesting, I'd like this. Mm. Maria? Uh, yeah, um, I'm also a teacher. Um, and. Uh, I've recently been through a uh, one-year teacher training, like uh, PPU, um, and in the end of this year, I went to the uh, learning mm. or the um, class with CCE, mm -hmm. uh, the yeah workshop one week, mm. and my 
uh, reflection from that was that f one week of training with this <laughs> taught me more about teaching students than one year of Pepu. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's sad, but yes. it's true. Mm. And I think from that I'm thinking that it doesn't really take much to learn the teachers and then also you could do it with the artists. Mm. Mm. Some techniques, some mm. ways in towards getting to this high engagement learning. Mm. And I think um, I think that it's um, uh, I lost my point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know I think a lot of teachers don't know how to uh, teach students in that way. Uh, you don't learn that in teacher schools in Norway. Sadly, uh, some maybe do, and I am happy for them, but mostly I don't think you do that because I don't think it's uh, people are not uh, informed and they they're not thinking that way. Mm. So um, that was a huge uh, bulb <laughs> lightening up for me, mm. and uh, I think it doesn't take much. That's mm. my point. Mm. So it's possible to absolutely mm. do a lot in a very short amount of time, and uh, with little effort, you can do a lot. Mm. Elisabeth? Nei, det var Kari, var det? Ja. Nei, Kristin, unnskyld. Um, uh, you asked uh, what are uh, our experiences mm. concerning these matters. We have also had this kind of school development project in Oslo uh, for many years, which are uh, very similar to the CC uh, creative partnership uh, projects. And I have started to talk about it as bridge making, making bridges. Um, because I think um, with these kind of projects, we go into the school with professional artists mm. and guidance from a professional uh, milieu, high school in Oslo, which would be the same like the, the cultural uh, agent in the CCA projects. And um, going into the school with these kind of projects, with the professional artists, working with creative processes, uh, working with the teachers and the pupils, together, um, where the gymnastic teacher, for example, experienced that he is also creative because they were working with an architect architectonical project in one school mm. and the gymnastic teacher uh, told us they started to work with uh, architectonical creations with their bodies in the gymnastic hour and had everything connected, you know, mm. in mathematics they worked with, uh, of course, the same uh, subject. And this uh, also makes the teachers and the students in these schools perhaps more able to enjoy a concert, so to say. Mm. Because they kind of, you see what I mean? It's kind no. of like a bridge making mm. between the school and the school's premises and working with development in mm. the school, working with the teachers together with the students. And that kind of translates into a better better premises for experience, uh, other artistical mm. things that come to the school, mm. which could, could be just a simple concert. It's like the experience with the uh, art gallery. Mm. Uh, when they gave the lecture, mm. the normal lecture, boring mm. lecture afterwards, it wasn't boring anymore mm. because they had been through what they had been through mm. beforehand. Mm. So I totally agree with you with this. It's just kind of mm. easy, small things to make kind of bridges mm. in the schools then we are hopefully getting somewhere. Mm. And I think there are this kind of a missing link. Mm. We've been talking about this missing link for 13 years. Mm. Mm. I think there's something mm. there. <laughs> uh, yes, Vivian. I think that many teachers want to change how they do education, um, but they don't dare to take the first step. Mm -hmm. And this is what this program is doing, um, and what we're trying to do in, in um, Upland uh, through our Creative Partnerships program in five um, upper secondary high schools. Uh, but that's that's like a, that's a tiny project uh, mm -hmm. compared to all the students we have mm -hmm. in upper secondary um, schools. But if we can get our artists in the cultural rucksack. Um, 
to be that person, the teacher's mm -hmm. helper. Mm -hmm. um, the, to be the person to hold the teacher's hand while they take the first step. Mm. Um, I think that could be very effective. Uh, but that leads to a, another question that I've had and I've been thinking about for a while. Uh, where does our responsibility stop mm. as the cultural rucksack? Is training teachers our job? Um, and if, if so, it requires a better co collaboration with the uh, educational departments because mm. that's where the money is. Um, but we've decided to do it anyway because we believe in it so much. But um, I don't know how long we can do it for. Mm. Mm. Uh, yes. Um, the, I think Vivian raises a really important point there. Mm. Um, what... I think this process uh, is the question this process I is raising is without the engagement of the teacher, I think DKS will find it hard to have the impact on the children that you want to have. Mm. So at the moment, there's a very efficient machine who delivers large numbers of artists at all the schools and they do stuff there, right? Which is, which is wonderful and a huge achievement in itself. The, the question then becomes, what impact is it having? And I think the young people are saying it's not having as big an impact as it can do because it's not engaging us, it's not c uh, connecting with the learning. Uh, the, um, uh, the, tr the practitioners need more training and so on and so forth. But that does mean building a stronger relationship with the teachers. Um, if you're going to have the impact that you want to have. Mm. And I think that's then the question the DKS needs to ask, which is to achieve what we've set out to do. We need to do that. How do we do that? The qu the, that then becomes very expensive. <laughs> but then the question is the extent to which education is willing to partner <coughs> in this process and accept they're getting benefits as well mm. um, from this and therefore are willing to invest too. <laughs> But I would really, l I would really love to, <laughs> to because this is this is kind of it's both what you say now is part of a of a discussion that we have been having mm. a lot of times. Mm. I mean, how can we engage the the educational part? How can we get them to uh, uh, um, take responsibility for parts of this program, which is mm. obviously the question we yeah. keep on asking ourselves mm. all the time. Uh, and I would really like to, I, I don't know, I, I, I really wish that we could kind of get a sort of an answer and, and start getting there. Mm. Because we, we continue asking the same questions. And I don't know, I, I, you said that there's a link here. Mm. And maybe, maybe it's not that difficult, like you said, Marie. Maybe, maybe uh, it's not that difficult as it seems. Maybe it's a achievable in some sort of way. Uh, yes, Christian. It's a question of money. If you have so much money, mm -hmm. uh, this, this is what I have. And with this money, I have to give uh, so and so many experiences and I don't mm. know what. If I can choose to take some of that money and put it into more expensive projects, mm. if I can take a little bit more of that money and put it into mm. perhaps, uh, expensive projects, Maybe they won't have two concerts a year, for 10 years, or whatever, for mm. uh, productions per year, uh, pr you know. But maybe what the um, impact of what, maybe they will get less of mm. these kind of experiences. But maybe the impact will be better mm. if mm. I take a little bit more <laughs> of the amount of money I have mm. and put it into more interactive stuff uh, involving the teachers more, mm. involving the schools more. Go, go, maybe we're not working with all the pupils even. Mm. Maybe not all the pupils will get something mm. every year. Maybe just some of the students. Mm. Mm. I'm, I'm kind mm. of I'm yeah, yeah. Not giving you the answer. Yeah, I'm yeah. making a lot of questions so I can hear myself. But the question is that, yeah. is, is, is this, is the program of the cultural rucksack, is it designed in a way that you actually already now can make these changes in your region? I mean, uh, Isn't it possible kind of already? Yes. In yeah. our uh, man mandat, 
Say, say again, mandate. say again, I'm sorry. We can be more free within the, the mandat that yeah. we have. Yeah. That includes the Rikskonsertene. Mm. Uh, if we can be more free with how we uh, use the money. Mm. Uh, what what would that actually mean? I mean, because you are now, more I, I more mean, you are free to de decide what how to use yes. the money, yeah? Well, uh, uh, I'm not so sure that the concerts from Rikskonsertene are so free with... No, the but no, they, are, they have uh, this half limitation. Of, uh, what we deliver to the schools almost. Okay. Um, but uh, we have workshops. But it, maybe it's just a feeling, <laughs> mm. because we have always been uh, reporting on uh, how many productions each mm. student and so on. Mm. So, and it ha and there's a lot of uh, guidance lines that we need, you know, visual arts and music and theater and everything. And uh, it's impossible to give the students or the pupils mm. everything, but uh, you know. It's from the Sami people and the Nynorsk and the mm. Mongfol and there's so mm. many things we need mm. to, to cover. It's a kind of a big puzzle. Mm. And, uh, but would you think that if, 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 I mean, if we could kind of uh, broaden the mandate, uh, as you said, if we can say that, okay, you are free to choose now how many, how many experiences every child, you have to give an, uh, uh, an offer to every child because I mean that's the main obstacle of everything, but, uh, but you're free to decide how many, how often, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as far as I, as I know now, I look at you now, Sigri, mm -hmm. because you're, um <laughs> you're the government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, there, there are the actually, except that the Rikskonsertene has has the two uh, concerts a year for grundskolen, but for for a higher level, you're free to do whatever you like already. I mean, it wouldn't be a problem, would it? To redesign and say, okay, maybe you just get one experience this year. You won't get a, a wide range of different meetings from different, what you call it, uh, art mm -hmm. forms, yeah. but you will get like one musical experience this year and next year you get visual arts and that's what you get. Would that be possible within the limits of the program already? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe it has been a, uh, too much focus on counting. Yes. But um, with an expert group we can kind of um, uh, write about these things in the report and uh, and um, suggest uh, that we m make things differently. We'll see. Yeah, because we I we yeah. are listening to your uh, to what you're saying, mm. and we will uh, <laughs> <laughs> consider it. Consider it. Mm -hmm. It's because what I, what I find interesting is that it is it is it maybe ourselves that has made these limits to how we address the program, how we use the program. I mean, we, c we can't just blame Rikskonsertene for having like two concerts in there and saying everything is locked, because it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we because have this uh, ag agreement with the Rikskonsertene, uh, they're special because of the two concerts, mm. but uh, uh, the Ministry of Culture does not say that uh, you have to offer uh, five uh, different, yeah. Five different. Uh, well, we we don't say that. No. So actually, it's already there in the program. So it's some. It's in some sort. It kind of this. This also uh, shows that we have. I mean, we have a way of addressing the program as well that we need to redefine and and discuss over again, maybe. Okay, yes, on it. Just one comment. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's Thank been you. very nice listening to you, and I think it's a very good idea to ask them to do this program project mm. for mm. research, and it all comes up with uh, kind of knowledge and competence and insight and uh, quality, <laughs> and that's what we look into as well as Sigrid mentioned yes. our report yeah. at the moment, yeah. um, taking the risk of being listened to as a really old woman. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make a point that this program, the Cultural Rucksack or School Bag, actually was started between the two departments and was always the meaning. It actually started like a support for the school mm. to invite the artists 
into uh, their programs. So it's kind of sad listening to, oh, is this a problem? Mm. Why is it a problem? What are we to do? We've been mm. talking of, you know, it's power, mm. it's mm. money, it's mm. a lot of things. We have a complex story to mm. tell mm. you. Mm. <laughs> and it's been very nice that mm. you've been listening to the uh, pupils. Mm. 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 You've mm. really given us the pupils' voice. Mm. And uh, it's um, easy to recognize mm. what mm. you're telling. Mm. And we would very much like to quote some of your findings <laughs> yes. in our report, <laughs> if you allow us. <laughs> so, because of these problems, mm. as you point out, we have this expert group at the moment. Mm. And we have only one month to go. Mm. So, <laughs> okay. <thank you. laughs> yes, we wish you luck. <laughs> okay, you can get the last word, Paul, b uh, because I was thinking, what were your recomm uh, recommendations for like further research, <coughs> further knowledge, uh, actions to be taken, thoughts to be made, discussions to be had? <laughs> Is that the way of saying it? <laughs> discussions to be had. That was just my invention of English language, I'm sorry. Yes, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I think it's very important, one, that you don't forget how lucky you are and how wonderful you are in Norway. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, that... Um, because of working in the schools um, through the other programs we're doing and through this experience and so on and so forth, I still think young people in Norway get a great upbringing and have lots of wonderful opportunities um, with, within that. And I think um, uh, remembering at the start to say, we offer young people in this country an awful lot <laughs> the, and they are very lucky, um, is a good starting point. <laughs> the, uh, there, are, there are always bits that can be better right, in, in that process. Um, the, I think uh, it's very interesting to hear you talk about the origins of the programme and the partnership between education and culture. And I wonder if the children are pointing to the fact that that partnership is a bit broken. Um, that the cultural sector has remained very loyal to delivering and doing and so on and so forth. But the education sector maybe isn't as good a partner as it should be uh, in this process. Um, and therefore isn't facilitating the benefit um, that could come mm. from the program in the way that it is being offered. And therefore more could be made of the program if education was a better um, partner. Mm. And we had plenty from the children that I talked to you about, about the being punished for doing DKS, the yeah. atmosphere in school, that it's not important, it's not related to learning, and so on and so forth. Whilst in my view, everything we talked about today, if you go back to the UNESCO definitions of education, learning to know, schools do that, learning to do, little bit, learning to live together, learning to be, schools aren't doing it. This is the program that helps them do it, mm. if you see what I mean. And therefore, that partnership needs to be reaffirmed um, uh, in, in that process. Mm. Um, the, my feeling is that a small amount of training, like Maria's saying, <laughs> can go a hugely long way, mm. particularly amongst the uh, professionals who are delivering the program in, into DKS. Mm. Um, through other things that I've done, I think I'm particularly concerned about the museum and gallery sector mm. um, in uh, Norway, um, uh, about whether a lot of them actually want young people in their museums would be a good question to start off with. But, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I kind of think that they, there's clearly a job to be done there, which isn't a huge amount of money but it's to say so, um, some money uh, to be able to do that uh, is, um, would make a huge amount of difference. I think the points that we, we raised about the quality of the engagement that the artists have with their audience is a fundamental assessment which needs to be assessed before they go in to make sure they do that. Not all artists have that, not even all performers 
have it. I mean, you can see in some areas of music, their performances are very introverted and so forth, and they appeal to some audience, but they just don't have the um, uh, thing to go out uh, to be able to do that. Um, I think what finally on this young people thing is that this process showed that young people have a contribution to make to the discussion, mm. um, which, which is valuable to have. Um, but in a situation where you build their competence and you challenge their thinking, um, because I think it's quite easy to go, oh yeah, well we asked young people, they all just wanted Justin Bieber, mm. without going, well, why did you want Justin Bieber and what were you trying to say by wanting Justin Bieber and so on and so forth, is that in the end, their views are very mature and sophisticated. Mm. One of which I think was this really fascinating question about more gender specific programming, mm. which I think is really interesting um, issue. Uh, and kind of irritating point. As far <laughs> as. <laughs> mm. I mean, I mean it, it troubles me. Yes, it, it troubles, troubles me. my value. Yes. If you see what I mean. Yeah. But I think they, they're right to ask the question because I don't have a convincing answer mm. as to why mm. we would send out an offer saying this is absolutely suitable for grade six, but not go, this is more likely to appeal to girls than boys. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Uh, we're looking forward to the uh, the written report as well, mm -hmm. which will be fin finalized within five, six weeks mm -hmm. or so. Yeah. And then also there will be a presentation, uh, both of the written report and uh, uh, like visual yeah. material as well in Sirkines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes. And, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, hand out the, 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 the paper mm -hmm. as soon as it's uh, ready. Thank you very much, and thank you, Sven Erik Komeni, as well, for joining thank us. You. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. I think one thing, because you train your musicians, when you have the...